like the, in, the inflection. What's that? There are, are there people that are disagreeing that it's not a good morning? <laughs> ah. Oh, really? Uh, it was a pretty day this morning, actually. It was nice out. All right. So today we're in synchronization week. We're in the middle of synchronization week. So on Monday we talked about kind of some of the problems, the problems that we face, the problem that we face, right? We've created this thing called concurrency, and concurrency is, you know, it's like Frankenstein or something, right? I mean, we've, we've created this thing, and it's kind of, it's, uh, it's out to get us now, right? It's, it's, it's outgrown its initial purpose, and it's, it's, it's coming back. It's, you know, it's bumping around at night, and, and we need to find out something to do about it, right? And on Monday, we talked a little bit about the hardware bases for uh, synchronization, right? So hardware support for atomicity, atomic instructions, and today we're going to continue talking about higher level synchronization primitives. So how do we use those lower level primitives to build things that will actually be useful to system programmers? And in this class, we focus a little bit on things that are useful to kernel programmers, because for the foreseeable future, that's what you guys are, right? So we're going to talk. Today, specifically, I'm going to introduce you. So this is, um, you know, I, I thought a little bit, a little bit, for, for days I agonized about how to present this. And what I decided to do is do this. So today, I'm going to introduce these primitives to you. And unfortunately, the best way to introduce these primitives is frequently to use examples, but I'm not going to use any examples. Because on Friday, we're going to go through, oh, we're just going to spend the entire class going through a set of examples showing how to use these primitives to solve a set of problems, right? So I don't know if this is the best way to do it. It's how I decided to do it. So if it turns out badly, you can blame me uh, and, and, and take it out on me by doing badly on the midterm or something, OK? Um, so, so today we're going to talk about these primitives. And then again, on, on Friday, we will go through you know, several well-worked through examples of how to use them in actual code. And you guys will have more chance to use these on assignment one and then throughout the course to solve some real synchronization problems. So for assignment one, we're going to give you some toy synchronization problems to solve. OK. So speaking of assignment one, assignment one is on its way, as you guys remember from waiting from assignment zero. Sometimes uh, maybe a little pieces of it will be dribbled out. Uh, but it's, it's coming, right? And, and part, of, part of what we're doing, you know, you guys might say, well, blah, 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 you know, this course has been taught before, and all the assignments are online, so why is this so difficult, right? Why is it so hard? I mean, just take the assignment, just put it up online for, you know, for crying out loud, right? Well, one of the things about this class, at least the assignments that I'm familiar with, is that they were usually graded by about, you know, 10 times as many TAs as I have for this class. So one of the things we're doing is we're releasing the assignments is we're trying to think about how can we structure them and how can we structure your submissions so that they can be graded effectively by a small group of people, right? And so please bear with us. And I just want to make sure that when stuff comes out, then it's in the form that, that I want it. It's a form you guys are going to do it, OK? Um, so I think, I think we've made a decision about the Tuesday recitation. And the decision about the Tuesday recitation is that there will not be a Tuesday recitation any longer, right? Uh, Sonali showed up yesterday. Nobody else did. This is clearly not a recitation that is super popular, so uh, let's just kill it. And uh, you guys can attend one of the other three recitations. For now, I think those are, those are the time and place for those are set. Uh, if, if we have any luck in moving out of Talbot 111, we'll let you know. Uh, but for now, the, the locations are online. OK, so for assignment zero, um, yeah? Uh, I, I don't remember which recitation it is. The, the website is correct. Currently, there are two recitations, and again, I should know this. There are two recitations at Davis 113. Do you remember? That's the Thursday morning. And which is the other one that's? What's that? Anyway, you guys could check it on. And it, apparently, no, nobody on the staff knows when these are. But, but uh, we, yeah, so the website is right, as far as I know. Currently, there are two recitations in Davis, and there's one in Talbert, right? And the Talbert one, again, we might think about moving just because that room doesn't have a projector. Um, but, you know, I mean, Sonali's going to get in good shape from lugging the projector back and forth to Talbert if we don't find a new room. So, you know, things will work out OK. Um, all right, so for assignment zero, 
I was, um, you know, I, I, I kind of see this pattern developing where suddenly, like on Sunday, there's a lot of interest in doing the assignment, right? Um, so let, let me point out a couple things to you guys. The first thing is, uh, in general, right, and the last couple weeks have been an exception, but in general, I don't work after 6 p.m. and I don't work on the weekends, right? I work my butt off when I'm here during the day, but I don't feel a you know, obligated to answer your emails after hours or on the weekends. So when you guys have due dates, keep that in mind. Because in the future, you know, if you guys are sending frantic emails that, you know, uh, on Sunday, they're just going to be ignored, right? You guys, I'm actually giving you guys a lot of time to do these assignments, more time than is given at other places, and there's really no excuse for waiting to the last minute, right? And especially, there's no excuse for waiting to the last minute and then sending these completely clueless emails that are like, oh, uh, you know, how do I do this and that? It's like, you know, we've covered all this weeks ago and it's been emails been sent out repeated to the class list, right? So some of you guys have experienced a little bit more of my like brusque sort of trying to clear out my uh, inbox style. And some of you guys that I'm, I'm, I've, I've been a little bit more beneficent to. So the entire class got a break on the assignment zero deadline, that, but that's not going to happen again, right? And it, look, it's just your responsibility to deal with you know, mysterious internet connectivity issues and you know, b bizarre weather events or whatever, right? I mean, that's why we give you more than, more than enough time to, to hand these things in, right? So in the future, this, there's not going to be a conversation about due dates, right? So you guys are responsible for getting started early enough to finish, all right? Any questions about that? So OK, here's my little quiz, right? Full credit for anything. And again, I mean, on assignment zero, if you had submitted half the code reading questions before 8 p.m. and then the other half ap after 8 p.m., we're going to grade the ones that you turned in on time, or we're just not going to grade the others, right? So this is, this is the policy when it comes to late work. Any questions about this? All right, hope this is pretty clear. Yeah? So, so for submitting script files, what I suggest you do is just open a web browser inside VirtualBox and upload things that way. You can set up shared folders between VirtualBox and your host OS. I do that to move files back and forth. But guess whose responsibility that is? Yours, right? And there's lots of documentation about to do this, right? These aren't mysteries. This is a really, VirtualBox is a pretty well-supported tool, right? So there is definitely stuff out there. But my suggestion is just use a, use a web browser inside the virtual machine, right? Yeah. There were 21 questions. Okay. <laughs> there were, yeah. So starting with zero. Yes, exactly. So uh, there is a different save, for, save button for each. So if we press the save button after the deadline, so uh, our assignment is submitted after the This means that our assignment is submitted after the deadline. Right. Okay. Yes. So, so if you, I think what, what, the way I set it up for the first assignment is that if you hit save after the deadline, just none of the new stuff would be saved. But anything that you had previously loaded would be, would be kept, right? So if there's one answer missing and you hit save at 501, then all the other answers will be in the database. Those will be graded. The other one will just not be there, right? OK. All right. So oh, more questions. Uh, really chance for the next project, we'll get like a grading rubric or breakdown? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. In fact, I was just talking with Robert about that. So, um, so my philosophy with grading, and, and we talked a little bit about this at the beginning of, of class, but it's, it's good to come back to you now as we start to get into some of the, the better assignments. So I, the, so there's two things, right? One is that you know, I don't have enough TAs to really do a lot of grading by hand, right? So a lot of what we're going to do to test your assignments is we're going to run tests, right? We're going to run tests. And we're going to run tests that we're going to provide to you guys, right? So in general, I don't, I don't think grading should be a mysterious thing. Right? My goal is that when you submit an assignment, I've made it possible for you to figure out pretty much how you did on that assignment. Right? So I'm going to give you guys all the tools you need right, to test your assignments in a way that's essentially analogous to what we're going to do. Right? Now, we may run the test more times, right? just bang on the system a little harder. Right? But the tools to test your, your kernel are there. Right? And the reason for this is that I want you guys to know, you know how well you've done the assignments. You can decide whether or not you want to keep working or stop. Right? I mean, if you work on assignment two for a week and you've got everything working and you run all your stress tests and everything passes, then you're done. Right? You can go have fun. You can build some more stuff if you want to. You could implement pipes. You could do copy and write for fork, whatever. You could do all sorts of fun stuff. But, 
But again, my, my goal is that the, the grading, like when you get a grade for this class, I don't want it to be a surprise, right? I don't want you to think, oh man, I submitted a, you know, an A assignment and I get a C, right? And there is, you know, grading to some degree, and, and I, I don't, you know, this is unfortunate, but with a big class like this, it should work out. Where grading is going to be somewhat, somewhat relative, right? So if the entire class does terribly on assignment two, then maybe a terrible submission will look a little bit better to us, right? But in general, I think that, you know, my experience at UB is that there are really some strong programmers here. So I'm expecting to see some really, really good submissions, right? And we're giving you guys more time, right, in order to complete the assignments. Does that answer your question? Okay. So, so again, my philosophy with grading is no surprises, right? Like, if you submit something and, and we have really different results, then, you know, you should talk to us. But, but our goal is to not have that happen, right? Our goal is to tell you, Here's the test that we're going to run on your kernel, because these are the tests you should be running anyway, right? I mean, these are the tests that you run to figure out if stuff works, right? Because other than kind of look at the code really hard and convince yourself, that's how we test systems, right? We run regression tests, we run unit tests, we run stress tests, and we see what happens. Right? Any other questions? There was one other question over here. Yeah, Calvin. Uh, with the submission deadlines, yep. the last two assignments, um, the late days that we had. Yep. No, I, I, the, the, our, the goal will be, well, that will just be automatic, right? So if you submit by that, basically, you know, we will figure out, at some point, you know, you're going to tell us this is, this is the assignment to grade, right? And if you tell us that before, if you submit something before the deadline, you won't be docked any, you won't be charged any late days. If you submit it after the deadline, we'll calculate it, the number of late days. And we'll, 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 we'll have it on the website so you can figure out how many late days you have left. So again, this is something that we'd like to, to automate and is automatable, so why not? Yeah, did you have a question, Malik? Okay. All right, any other questions about this stuff? Good, good, good. We will, and again, I'll, I'll, the, the website could be updated with some grading policies and stuff like that, so I'll try, to, I'll try to get to that soon. Okay. So again, Monday, material, questions. At the end, we kind of went into a little bit of turbo mode, so today I, I've tried to keep the, the lecture a little bit lighter so we can go back and, and talk about stuff, okay? But let's review, but hold on, let me just give everybody a chance. Monday, 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 Monday. Concurrency, critical sections, hardware support for synchronization. Any questions about that material? Questions, questions, questions. Okay, all right, it's quiz time. So, back here, no just worry. The illusion of concurrency is both what and what? Take a guess. Well, I mean, but, but the illusion of concurrency is, is to, to programmers, right? What are we? No, you're telling me how it works, right? But I'm asking you is why, like, why, why do, what is that? Powerful and useful. Powerful and useful. Oh, right, wow, verbatim, right? It's incredible <laughs> that he got that because it was actually on a slide on Monday, right? So, um, so I've, started, I've, I've started to, I have a way now of doing this, so, so these slides are, are very familiar. <laughs> Right? And the reason is it helps, think us, it has helps us think about how to structure our applications, right? And it can hide latencies caused by slow hardware devices, right? These are some of the reasons that we concur, right? Because synchronization, when you guys start working on synchronization problems, sometimes you're going to start thinking, man, why, why do I concur? <coughs> like, what, why, do, why am I doing this to myself? Okay. Um, concurrency also causes problems, right? So what are some of the problems that concurrency causes? Over there, the, the red corner. One problem. You want to help them out? Anybody over in this corner of the room? Synchronization, synchronization right? So, so, so it could, it could. If I don't synchronize, right? What, what could happen, right? Any other guesses from over here? So I could have, I could have a race condition, and a race condition results in. In what? So a race condition would affect correctness, right? So the two problems with concurrency are, first of all, now I have these threads running around, and I need to figure out how to coordinate activities between those threads, right? Again, go back to the Cook's, the Cook's analogy, right? Everybody's working together. Everybody's doing different things. People are trying to, to build up something together, right? So I need to figure out you know, how do I communicate between them to make sure that everybody's not making the mashed potatoes, right? And nobody is making the beautiful sous vide steak. Okay, and then correctness, right? So the, the correctness is, is a problem where if I don't access shared state correctly, 
and in a safe way, that shared state might be corrupted, right? So this, this is kind of the bank account example that we looked at, right? The bank account balance was corrupted by interleaved execution by two concurrent threads, right? And that was caused, the, this, so this is a correctness problem, right? I think we're gonna get to, right, so animicity, right? So what is, concurrency is the illusion that, anybody? Multiple things are happening at a time, and, and more importantly, more things are happening at a time than I have cores to actually happen things at a time, right? Okay? Atomicity, on the other hand, is the illusion that what? Over here. Well, it's not just one thing. Ooh, you guys are kind of veering around the answer. Yeah, come. Right, right, right. So, so something that actually requires multiple instructions happens all at once, right? From the perspective of anybody else observing the world. Now, the, the thing here is, right, so how, if I'm a thread and some other thread's running, right, how do I observe what it's doing, right? How, how does it change my world? Anybody? Any ideas? Remember, what, what, what do threads share in general? An address space, there's a lot of shared state between threads. That's what allows threads to work on the same problems, right? If threads were completely isolated from each other, then there would be no way for them to coordinate at all, and they couldn't be doing the same thing. It's like you know, taking, you know, two, taking two cooks and putting them in completely separate kitchens and telling them to prepare a meal together, right? They can't do it, right? They, they, you know, there, there's no way for them to even. even. So shared state is, is the thing that I have to update atomically, right? So atomicity, so, so what it means to happen all at once is that another thread is never able to see the shared state in some sort of you know, intermediate or unsafe uh, state, right? Questions about this, right? I want to make sure you guys see. Yeah. Um, some threads work depending on other uh, threads work. Yeah. Uh, sometimes maybe um, just like a cook, uh, you need to yep, yep. read the recipe first and then you add some uh huh. And, uh, just like this, and there are some orders about that. Yeah. So how to deal with the concurrency in this case? Right. So this. So what I think what you're talking about is, is an example of coordination, right? And we're going to talk a little bit. So last time in class we focused on correctness. Today we're going to talk about a, a couple of primitives that allow us to actually do coordination, right? So coordination is is more this idea of signaling, right? Like you know I want to tell yeah I want to tell another cook. You know, and I want to, like for example, I might want to tell just one cook, right, in the kitchen to do something, right? And if I just yell it out, three cooks might start doing it, right? So there are some mechanisms that are built uh, that allow us to, to signal in certain well-defined ways, right? So but that's, a, that's a good point, right? We need to coordinate, not just be correct. Okay. So, okay. Assumptions you can no longer make about your code when you are writing a multi-threaded application. And when you are writing the kernel for this class, what can you not assume about your code? Threads may. What's that? Execute in the same order or in any order. Threads may execute in any order, right? Be run in any order, right? You cannot make any assumptions about what the scheduler does. The threads may be run ABC, they may run CBA, they, you, you have no idea. So any, any modifications you make to shared state that depend on thread ordering are going to fail unless you ensure that you get the ordering you want. Okay? What else can you not assume about threads? Over here. Could be stopped at any time, right? Unless explicitly synchronized, right? And we talked about critical sections, which is a way of making sure that I'm not stopped, or at least I'm not interrupted in the process of doing something. But in general, yes, I can be stopped and started at any time, right? I don't have control over when I preempt. And then the last thing. Um, the comment, even if you had the uh, power to like, control the stop and start, Right, 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 right. Yeah, so, so I'm not saying that, that relaxing any of these assumptions would be sufficient to solve our problems, right? I'm just saying these are the things that you have to keep thinking about when you write multi-threaded applications, right? When you look line by line by line, when you look at two different functions that access shared state, you have to think these functions can be interleaved in essentially any order, right? They can be run one after each other. That's usually okay, right? Because that, that usually, that's usually what you want if you haven't synchronized things properly. But they can also be just interleaved in any way, any way, right? So if there's any point at which state is 
is, that has been left by a thread in an inconsistent position. And an, another thread, that, that is the moment when we grade your assignment where the other thread will run and do something wrong, right? Okay, last, last thing. This is kind of related to number two. Anybody remember from last time? What's that? Well, well, that's, that's kind of a, a, a function of these three things, right? But the last thing is a thread can be stopped for an arbitrary length of time, right? So that really, that really comes into the interleaving. So again, one way to think about it is if you have two threads, if you have a function that actually has a shared state, that function may interfere with itself and may interfere with other functions that access shared state. And essentially, any there's, there's no limit to the number of different ways that you can interleave those unless you do something about it. OK? Yeah? Well, the system is going to schedule the threads, right? We're going to talk about that next week. But my point is that you can't make any assumptions about how the scheduler works, right? You can't, you know, you can't assume that, what's that? Um, if you understand safely in the system, how the system works, can you control the thread? No. <laughs> you, you, again, don't make any assumptions about how threads are scheduled, right? It doesn't matter if you understand how the system, if you think you understand the system scheduler, because there's probably two things wrong with that, right? One is that you actually don't. Right? And, and the other is that it might change. Right? So somebody might write a new scheduler, somebody might change a scheduling policy, whatever. Right? Schedulers in general are very dynamic and, and fairly complicated in terms of how they work. Right? And so the safest thing to do and the only correct thing to do is to just not make any assumptions about that. It's really, it's really hard to write code that makes assumptions about thread scheduling anyway. Right? This is just something to keep in mind. Right? OK, so critical section. We talked about critical sections. A critical section is an area of code where we think of only one thread being able to execute in that critical section at a time. Right? So it's a stream of instructions that once I start executing those instructions, no other threads may be executing instructions that is inside that area of code. Right? That area of code can be a single function. It can be parts of functions. It can be parts of multiple functions. There's no real limit on what I can include in a critical section. Right? Sometimes we think about it as only being in one function, but there's really no reason that it can't span multiple functions, and frequently it will. Right? OK, requirements for the critical section. The first one is mutual exclusion. What does that mean? What's that? One only one thread can run. It's just what I said. It's the definition. Right? If you don't get that right, then you don't have a critical section. Right? Um, but, but, it, but one of the things, and I should have had a slide about this. Right? One, of the things to keep, one of the things to keep in mind here is, and maybe this goes without saying, but None of the tools that we talk about today work if you don't use them properly. Right? So for example, you may set up a critical section in your function that, accesses, that, that controls access within that function to a shared variable foo. Okay? Unbeknownst to you, your partner for assignment two may write another function somewhere else that modifies foo without grabbing the same lock or without, estab without joining your critical section. Right? You're toast, right? It's over, OK? So, so the, getting this right is important. These, these primitives are tools. If they're not used correctly, all bets are off, right? And, and a, lot of, you know, a lot of what you guys are going to struggle with is getting this stuff right, right? So these, these tools are useful. They're powerful. But if you don't lock around every access to a shared variable, then you might, you might not as well, you know, you might, you might, you might as well not lock, blah, blah, blah. you might as well not lock anywhere. All right? OK, so mutual exclusion. Uh, progress. What, is, what do I mean by progress? Does anyone remember? At some point, if I, try to start en if I try to enter a critical section, I'm going to enter the critical section. Right? I'm not going to be stopped forever. Right? And usually, I want to bound the amount of time that threads spend waiting to get in a critical section. Now, that could vary based on the number of threads that are trying to get in, because I have to only let one at a time. But in general, I don't want a situation where, for whatever reason, one thread's been trying to get in for you know, many, many, many time quanta, and other threads keep jumping in front of it. Right? It's so like fairness, it's, it's, this is, an, this is a, a, attached to an idea of fairness. Right? If I try to enter the critical section, I should be able to execute in the critical section. And we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit on Friday about how scheduling can actually impact this guarantee. So that's an interesting, it's something called priority inversion. OK, performance. What's the last thing about critical sections? 
I want them to be small, right? And the reason is, when, I, when I'm executing inside a critical section, I'm essentially reducing the amount of possible concurrency on the system. So if I make my critical sections really big, I'm taking all this useful concurrency that I went to all this trouble with context switching and multiple cores and all this stuff to create, and I'm essentially reducing it down to nothing. Right? I don't want to do that. Right? I want the system to be as concurrent as possible while being safe. So I limit my critical sections to only the instructions necessary to make changes to shared state. And there are some interesting design patterns. We'll talk about one on Friday, right? Where one way of, you know, let's say I have a bunch of complex updates to do to a piece of shared state. One of the ways to do that is to create an object locally, set it up the way I want, and then use a critical section to just swap the object with the object that's already there, right? So rather than you know, having all the modifications I need to make inside the critical section, I make my modifications locally first, and then I quickly you know, copy my object or flip the pointer around so that you know, my object is included in the shared data structure that I'm accessing, right? So that way I can reduce the critical section down from all these instructions that I needed to set up whatever new you know, uh, leaf in my tree I was setting up or whatever, and I can reduce it down to just the pointer swap. Right? Or just adding a pointer or something like that. OK. So let's see. OK, I think, we, I think we've basically done this, right? And maybe I got out of order. OK, any other questions about concurrency and critical sections in particular? All right. So, so at, at the very end of Monday, uh, we, went, we were going through this bank example, and we're going to go back to the bank example in a minute, just in case any, any, and anyone needs any more hints about, about what, what I'm lacking in my own life. Um, but this, this is, uh, so what we came up with at the end was an example of using what's called a lock. Okay? A lock is a very, very common and very basic synchronization primitive that are used to implement critical sections. And the, the, the way I think about it is, you know, imagine there's a room and you, you want all the shared, you have some shared state, and that shared state lives inside the room. And the way you access the room is you go inside, and you turn around and you lock the door. Okay? And while the door is locked, you can make whatever modifications you want to that shared state, and no one else can see it. When you leave the critical section and open the door, now that shared state is visible to anybody else. Right? Now, the, of course, the problem with this analogy is, as I said before, if you have shared state, that is accessed both while holding a lock and while not holding a lock, is it inside the room or outside the room? So now we have like a, a quantum mechanical problem, right? So, so it's not, this is not a perfect metaphor, right? But the point is that this is, this is one way of thinking about this, right? Mutual exclusion implemented using a lock, okay? So let's modify our example to use a lock, okay? And, and, and what were the steps that we had to go through to fix the synchronization problem with this give gua the moolah function? What was the first thing we had to do? Oh, whoops, there it is, okay. Identify the critical section. So who remembers what the critical section was? Uh, no, 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 Malik, you're answering too many questions. I need someone who hasn't spoken up today. What about you? One, two, three. One, one, one to three, right? So I, unfortunately, I, I forgot the line numbers today, but it's essentially this piece of code, okay? And then, once I identify the critical section, using locks is quite easy. What I need to do is I need to lock before I enter the critical section. I need to unlock after, right? So using the, um, so the, here's my critical section. Using the, the terminology associated with some of the primitives that we're going to ask you to implement for assignment one, first I, need, first I need a lock, right? I need some sort of shared structure that, that holds information about the lock. And again, you guys are going to implement this. And then I need to acquire it and release it at the right points in the code. Okay? Questions about this? Yeah. Uh, this lock acquire and lock release should be atomic by themselves. So how do we ensure that? Right. So okay. So lock acquire and lock release are right. The, the implementations of those have to be atomic. And the way they work on your system is that they or the way they well, I shouldn't say this. Um, normally locks are implemented using a lower level synchronization, right? Your system has some lower level primitives that can be used to do this, right? But at some level, right, what ends up happening with any of these primitives is that you start with some C code and maybe you update some state, but eventually there's some hardware instruction that you're going to use that is guaranteed by the system to be atomic, right? 
So all of these things are based on those hardware basis of atom atomicity that we talked about last time, right? So the test and set instruction, compare and swap, right? Some hardware instruction that the hardware guarantees to be atomic, okay? Calvin, yeah. In the case of like a multi-core system, yep. that could kind of technically be run like on different cores at the same time. Well, how does that? So, so right, so on a multi-core system, what the hardware has to do is it's still, like test and set, for example, has to work on a multi-core system. And multi-core systems go to great lengths to get those instructions to work properly, right? So a multi-core system will say, test and set has a certain semantics where it's guaranteed to be correct across all cores. And you can imagine that might require flushing cache lines from other cores, that might require locking the whole memory bus so they don't have interleaved access. So there's, there's a fair amount of kind of um, effort that goes in at the hardware level to guarantee an atomicity. Right? But those hardware instructions, even on multi-core systems, have to be atomic. Right? Otherwise, there's, there's no basis for synchronization, at least not, not in an easy way. Right? OK, so this is how we use the lock. Now, last time we talked about a particular approach to this. But let's say that, you know, that the, what, I, what I want to happen, ideally, is that a lock, I want lock acquire to just return. Right? No one else is in the critical section. I'm clear. I release the lock. You know. There's no concurrency problem. And if the calls don't overleave, then, then this should just run the way we, we would expect. Okay? The problem is, what happens if a thread calls lock acquire and there is another thread inside the critical section? So what do I have to do? Well, there, there are two approaches, right? So last time we talked about active waiting, right? So I can, so I have to wait. I have to wait somehow, right? I have to, I cannot execute the instructions inside the critical section until the other thread exits the critical section. So I need to do something in the meantime, right? And there's two approaches to this, right? How do we wait? So we, last time we talked about busy waiting, spinning. So we talked about a spin lock implementation where I repeatedly ran this test and set instruction until I got a result that indicated that I could proceed, OK? And this is one approach to, to doing this, right? Now, what's, what's, what's a, and people had, had uh, hinted at this last time. What's potentially a better approach, or different approach, I should say? I can I can passive wait, right? I can sleep, okay. And sleeping is done in the kernel, on your kernel and in other kernels, by telling the kernel, I'm going to go to sleep, right? I would like to be descheduled. However, I would like to be reawakened. So I'm going to go. I'm going to go from the you know the running state to the waiting state. But I'm going to tell the kernel, this is some information about what happens. That I when when I want you to wake me up, right? So frequently you can think in OS 161, David has implemented something called wait channels, right? That's one way of thinking about it. I'm waiting. It's like a queue, right? I get into a particular queue. And I count on the guy who's, who's inside the room to poke me when, when he's done. Right? But I need to give something to the kernel to identify what I'm waiting on. Right? And you know, that's done in different ways. It can just be some arbitrary, I think I have something about this. Um, it, it can be some sort of, eh. it can be some sort of arbitrary key. We'll talk in a second about how this, is, how, how this would be implemented. Right? But the idea is that the kernel has to provide a way for me to ask to go to sleep and to give it some information about what happened, what is going to happen in the future that is going to cause me to wake up. Okay? Now, la last time I may have given you the impression that spinning, active waiting, is never a good idea. Okay? And it turns out that this is not actually true. Right? And there's a reason why, for example, your system has spin locks and many other systems have spin locks. Okay? Now, spin locks are almost, I shouldn't say almost, are probably never, ever a good idea on a single core system. Why is that? Why would I never want to spin waiting for a lock on a single core system? Yeah, Ben. Because then you just take extra two threads over from another thread to use. And what other thread might use those? The thread that you're waiting for to be done. Exactly. So if I'm waiting on another thread to execute the critical section on a single core system and I'm burning up CPU cycles, active waiting, then I'm guaranteeing that that thread is going to take longer to finish. So the best thing to do is to get out of the way as fast as possible, go to sleep, let the thread run, and have it wake me up when I'm done. So in general, spinning 
on single core systems is almost never a good idea. In fact, I can't think of a case in which is a good idea. Maybe I'll look it up and see if I can find it. OK, now on a multi-core system, why is this different? Why does this assumption relax on a multi-core system? Anybody want to venture a guess? Yep. So I, th I think that's right, and let me, let me explain it a different way. On a multi-core system, it is possible that the thread that I am waiting on is running on another core. And in that case, what, what happens is, so on a single core system, nothing can change, right? If the critical section is short, really short, on a multi-core system, it can be beneficial to actually wait actively, right? The reason for this is that context switching, which is what I'm going to do if I go to sleep, has overhead to it, right? We talked about this a, you know, a week ago, right? All these registers I have to save, and I have to reschedule another thread, et cetera, et cetera. So sleeping is not free, right? Sleeping is going to take some time, and then I have to you know, rely that at some point later in the future I'm going to get a chance to run. So if what I'm trying to do, and frequently when I have a critical section, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to maximize the throughput of threads through that critical section. right? When threads are inside the critical section, I want them to leave, and I want the other guy to get in as fast as possible, right? assuming that there's a lot of contention for the critical section. Right? So here's an example of how this might work. Right? If my critical section is really short, right? so here's a case on a two CPU system where thread one was inside the critical section, but the critical section is very short. Right? So thread one only spends this tiny, tiny little bit of time. Sorry. Oh my gosh, I've got two thread ones. OK, never mind. The, the green thread. The green thread is inside the critical section. Okay. The red thread over here tried to enter the critical section and failed and decided to go to sleep. Right? And what happens? Right? So there's all this overhead to doing a context switch, and then another thread's going to run, and then I have another context switch, and finally, down here, this guy gets to run again and he can enter the critical section. But what's happened is I've wasted all this time right here where the thread, this thread, had it just busy waited a little bit, could have entered the critical section more rapidly. Right? So I've, I've reduced the throughput of the threads through my critical section. On the other hand, if the critical section is long and I spin, then I'm wasting CPU cycles on the other CPU. Right? So here's an example. Let me just finish this one, where you know, this guy's inside the critical section for a while, and this guy should probably go to sleep. Right? He doesn't. He decides to spin, and he just whack, 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 and then, and then finally later he gets in. Right? So this is a period of time on CPU 2 that could have been used to do other useful work. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Ah. Yeah. How would the how would the thing know would it know the difference between whether or not you've been locked or just been waiting? Because you could block, I guess, or not an extra thread that might not have anything to do with whatever. Oh gosh. Right. My brain can only handle two threads. But if but if you come to office hours we can work through this example. Right, with three threads. Yeah. Uh, how does how do you tell the length of the critical section? Just like the lock hold that information? Well, you as a programmer know that, right? When you when you write your code and you guys design critical sections, you will you will have some concept of how long they are. Right? In this, for this class, your critical sections will almost all, always be long enough where it makes sense to sleep. Right? But what you'll see is that inside some of the synchronization primitives that you're going to implement, there are cases where the critical section is very short. And in those cases, you actually use a spin lock to access some shared resource. Right? So one of the things you guys are going to do for assignment one, you can start this whenever you're ready, is you're going to look at the implementation of semaphores inside your kernel. Because that implementation works. Right? That's, that's, the, that's the hints that we've given you for the other pieces. Right? We gave you a working implementation of semaphores. You can run the semaphore test. It works. And you can see how that code is implemented. Right? And the semaphore implementation, we're going to talk about semaphores in two minutes. Semaphore implementation that we gave you uh, uses a spin lock. Any other questions about active versus passive waiting? I just want to make sure that you guys understand this design choice because it's really, it's, it's again, it's another one of those cases where there's a trade off, right, between how I uh, access resources. Yeah? Can you have some kind of condition that's appropriate that we're saying it's like length, keep the critical section length, like which is X amount of length, then the efficiency is decreased because of physical mass, which is time? Yeah. And 
well, actually, I don't know if that's actually implemented on, on real systems, but you, you could think about it. You could do some sort of you know, uh, compile time profiling to try to understand how long the critical section is and choose an appropriate synchronization permitter. You also have cases, uh, we talked before about, about not wanting to spin on single core systems. So there are things called adaptive mutexes that essentially look like a lock, but will you know, we'll, we'll turn off interrupts on a single core system, which we talked about last time, but will not spin. And then on a multi-core system, they will spin, right? So they basically, you know, you can just use it like it's a lock, but the system decides how to implement it based on the hardware that you're, you're, you're creating the system for. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is my second question. Yeah. The thing is, uh, as programmer, I'm not talking about the operating system in general. Yep. When you're a programmer, you don't think about how locks work, right? You Frequently, have, no. Uh, you might have some operating system existing on a particular thread. Uh -huh. You might have some other stuff going on in another thread. I, so I don't, I don't think so. So, so, one of the, so one of the things I should say is that um, the, the audience for this discussion, again, as I said earlier in class, is really kernel programmers, right? So I'm focusing more in class on the applicability of these primitives to system programming, right? How these are used in user space, there's actually a, a fair amount of similarities when you talk about locks and condition variables. And certain languages like Java and, and lots of other languages have even more sophisticated support for concurrency that tries to make things even easier for programmers, right? So Java has these synchronized keywords, right, that essentially Im implement something that's almost like a lock, right? But for, for the purposes of this class and trying to keep things simple, I'm going to try to focus on, you know, how you would use these to program an operating system, right? But, but yeah, so there, there, Maybe to try to, to weasel around answering your question, um, there are there's a lot of good language support for concurrency and for synchronization, right? And that that may do, you know, a, try to do adaptive intelligent things, right? Now, what I've realized was like, are the languages the one which kind of enable this, or is it the OS which kind of helps the languages do it? Is it either the OS which is supposed to be the most? It's a good question. Um, so again, these these primitives are typically not provided. There, there's no, so there's no API, for example, for using the low-level synchronization primitives that the kernel uses, right? A lot of these can be implemented in user space and libraries, right? So if I want, you know, if I have a thread, if I have a user space thread package, I can implement locks, right, without entering the kernel at all, right? Just, you know, using my own knowledge of scheduling, right? Because if I have a user space thread library, I have a user space thread schedule, right? And so I can do some of these things in user space, right? So there are, there are ways to implement these primitives that don't involve any kernel support at all, right? And, and to the degree to which kernel prov the kernel provides the support for building synchronization primitives applications is a question that I don't know how to answer, and I, but I will, I will happily look it up for you, right? Yeah, other questions? All right, so let's talk. All right, so we talked about this before, right? The kernel provides a primitive that allows threads to sleep on some key. You know, that could be a number, it could be whatever. In, in, in OS 1621, it's a specific thing that you should figure out what it is, but it's usually some sort of identifier that, that, that identifies to the kernel, this is, this is the, the thing that, that is going to cause me to wake up, right? And then I'm, I can also wake up threads that are waiting on that value, right? And locks are implemented by, you know, if I, you know, I, I, I look at some piece of shared state, if the critical section is busy, I go to sleep, and when I'm inside the critical section, when I release the lock, I call wake, and I allow other threads that are waiting on that critical section to continue, okay? And as I just pointed out, you can implement these, a lot of these primitives in, in user space. All right. So, so locks are, in many ways, one of the more useful, from your perspective, of, as kernel programmers, the more useful synchronization primitives that we're gonna talk about in this class. Um, but locks are really fundamentally designed to protect critical sections. And as someone pointed out before, I might have the need also to enable certain forms of structured communication between threads. Um, lock release, you know, you can think about lock releases as implementing some communication pattern, right? I mean, when I call lock release, I'm essentially telling the threads that are waiting to enter the critical section, hey, one of you guys can enter the critical section, right? And when I call lock acquire, I'm essentially saying, hey, I'm inside the critical section. Nobody else can come in, right? Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know exactly why I put that up on the slide. 
But let's talk about sort of other kinds of communication between threads that I might want to enable, right? So what about if there's some data buffer that I'm filling, and when I'm finished, I need to notify another thread that that buffer is full, that that thread is going to do something with the buffer, like pass it to user space or process it or whatever, right? Or in IP, in, you know, when we talked about the semantics of fork and exit, right? I might need to tell the parent process when its child exits, right? I mean, you need to create a, a way for the parent to find that out, right? Or to access some shared state in a structured way. So condition variables you can really think of as a signaling mechanism that allows me to uh, wait until something becomes true or something changes and to notify other threads when that thing changes, okay? And, and unlike locks, the thing that's changing is uh, more general than just somebody's in the critical section or not in the critical section, right? And so, for example, that condition is usually represented as some, sh you know, some change to the shared state that me and another thread are accessing. So, for example, going back to the buffer that I just talked about, right? I might want to notify other threads that a buffer has data in it, right? So the shared state is the buffer, right? Or some size of the buffer variable that we're maintaining that's supposed to represent how much data is in the buffer, okay? And, and the communication is I want to tell somebody who's going to use the buffer, hey, the buffer's full and you can, you know, continue on and, and do what you need to do, right? I also want threads to potentially be able to wait until that condition becomes true. So if the, if the thread that's waiting for the buffer doesn't have anything else to do, it might wait on the thread that's filling the buffer to fill it, and then when that thread is done, it's going to signal this guy that he can, that he can proceed and, and do something with the data that's there, right? Again, I, th these are, are better, better done with examples, and we will do examples online, right? So I just want to introduce the semantics so that we can come back to it. Maybe this was a big mistake. Um, and again, so the CB signal is just a way of, of notifying other threads that, you know, there's data in the buffer now, right? I filled the buffer and, and some other thread that might be waiting, it might not be waiting, right? I might just change the state and then when the thread shows up to access the buffer, it might find data there and just proceed, okay? So again, condition variables con convey more information than I can with the lock, right? All the lock reflects is, is a thread inside the critical section or not? And when I think about my buffer example, I've got three states the buffer can be in, right? It could be full, it could be empty, or it could be somewhere in between. And I've got two things that threads are trying to do, right? They may be trying to put in data and they may be trying to withdraw data, right? And depending on the state of the buffer and the kind of thread that shows up, I want to be able to do different things, right? If the buffer's full, then I can't let threads put new things into it, but I can let threads take things out of it. If it's empty, vice versa. And if it's neither, then I may be able to, to try to safely allow threads to both add and remove data from, from a buffer, right? So we we're going to go through this example specifically on Friday. Yeah? Um, it, so there is a difference between notifying signal and uh, we will we'll come back to it on Friday. It has to do with the number of threads that, that are awakened. Broadcast. Right, broadcast and actually I'm not sure why I wrote notify. I probably should have been more careful. Usually, usually a condition variable has one way of telling one thread that's waiting on the variable and another way of telling every thread, right? And those can be useful in different situations, right? So in certain cases something changes and I just want to tell one thread, any thread, any thread that's waiting. And in other cases, something changes, and I need to tell every thread, right? And we'll talk a little bit about why to use either one of those calls on Friday. Yeah, Robert. If the thread is maintained by the terminal, right? How does the thread and the semaphore or the lock? Yeah. Would go, you would communicate to the terminal? So, so I'm talking, so for the sake of these examples, we're talking about communication through some shared state, right? Shared memory usually, and, and, and specifically, we'll be talking about communication within the kernel, right? So kernel threads communicating with each other through. What I'm saying is, like in Java, I think someone mentioned, yeah. know, it could be similar the object in Java. Right. But through here, you're going through the, the actual kernel. So when you acquire a lock, it doesn't really mean someone else is using it. You just want to lock it. But when you finish, even if didn't ask for it. You want to notify the kernel, oh, hey, I'm releasing the tree now on that particular variable being an object. 
so, so again, I just want to, but I just want to be clear, right? There is no, can we turn off our phones before class? Hello? Yeah. Um, I just want to be clear that there, there's no, I'm not sure what the API is for communicating with the kernel, right? For the sake of this, let's talk more about, you know, communicating through shared memory, right? Either in user space, where I can implement these, or in the kernel, right? All right. And then, how much time do I have? I have I'm going to take two extra minutes. All right, so semaphores, right? Semaphores, how many people are familiar with semaphores? Does anyone use a semaphore? Okay, good. So a semaphore you can think of as a shared counter. And what I provide are ways to increment and decrement that counter atomically. Now, the only trick with semaphores that makes them into a synchronization primitive rather than just a, you know, a, a reference count or something like that is that the semantics of semaphores is if the value is zero, and I try to decrement it, I have to wait until the value becomes greater than zero. So the semaphore value can never fall below zero. If the semaphore is zero and I try to reduce its value, I'll wait until somebody else increases it, and then I'll be able to decrease it, right? And, and so there is, now, you, now we can also talk about something that's called a binary semaphore. So a binary semaphore only has two values. And on a certain level, a binary semaphore, if it's used in the right way, starts to look a lot like a lock. So here's an example from before where I, you know, I use the decrement and increment operators on a binary semaphore to implement a lock around the critical section in this function. Does anyone know what the difference is? It's an important difference between a lock and a semaphore, a binary semaphore. Right? They look very similar. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. So locks have the concept of ownership. When I call lock release, the lock implementation will generally check to make sure that I am the one who is holding the lock. If I'm not, it'll fail, right? And it usually do, do something, you know, it'll assert something that, that will cause the system to fail. Because that's an error in the programming pattern, right? A lock is like I'm giving you a token, you have to bring it back to me, right? Semaphores have no owner. So even, you know, anybody, Anybody can P and B the semaphore in any order, right? And that's the, that's the difference. Semaphores are, what, uh, semaphores are a synchronization primitive that, that I am going to just put out there for this class are not necessarily all that useful. Semaphores have, part of the reason that semaphores are not that useful is that they can be tricky to get right because they have these loose semantics. So if you use them in the place of locks, you don't get that extra guarantee that says that the person who's holding the lock is the only one who can release it. Because that can be a really helpful programming tool that helps you find bugs in your code, right? But the semaphore, you don't get that. Any, anybody can pee me the semaphore, you know, anytime they want to, right? And so locks will help you correct programming problems. Semaphores do have a place, though, when it comes to things that are naturally counted, right? And we'll, we'll look at this on Friday when we use semaphores for an example, right? So let me just finish up by saying, on Friday, we're going to go through a set of synchronization problems. You're going to do more in assignment one, and you're going to keep coming back to this throughout the semester because there'll be lots of shared state in the kernel you have to synchronize. In general, the tools that we're giving you, there's usually a right tool for a problem. And part of what we're going to try to do next week through Friday and the assignment is give you some intuition about how to choose the right synchronization primitive. In many cases, you can solve the problem using multiple synchronization primitives, right? But one of the solutions will be weird and kind of delicate and won't feel right, even though it will kind of, it will work. And the other solution will be like, right, that's the right thing. So we're going to work on this on Friday and then in assignment one.